much. Uh, so warm welcome to all of you. I will sh share my screen. And uh, as I said, it's a very happy occasion to uh, celebrate uh, the Institute. Um, and instead of having uh, just uh, champagne or Prosecco, we also have, I would say, a reading from the Gospel of Abraham Flexner. And I will uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, the motto of the Institute, the inoffic inofficial motto of the Institute, which is not truth and beauty, but the usefulness of useless knowledge. And I, I think, as most of you know, this is, uh, it's, by the way, one of these essays that are more famous for their title than for their content. But it's an essay that uh, Flexner published in 1939. But actually, the first drafts of this, uh, including the title, are all from the early 1920s. So it's something that was in his mind for almost 20 years. And in 2017, uh, with uh, Princeton University Press, we reissued this book. Um, and I wrote a companion essay. And, and my presentation will be partly based on that companion essay. I want to share with you one of my uh, favorite anecdotes because I felt when we are, I'm co, since I'm my co author is Abraham Flexner, and Albert Einstein was essentially the first professor that Flexner brought to the Institute. There must be a nice quote of Einstein about Flexner. Wouldn't it be wonderful to publish your book with a quote of Albert Einstein endor endorsing your book? And I thought I would, could be in that position. And so I looked up the, uh, I have it here on my desk, the extended uh, unabridged version of Einstein quotations and look up Flexner in the index. And there's one quotation. So I thought I'm in, I'm in good luck. And this was the quotation. Flexner is one of the few enemies I've, I have here. Years ago, I conducted a revolt against him for which he fled. So then I proposed to publish the book with the quote, a uh, book, Albert Einstein, a book by one of my few enemies, but uh, Princeton University wasn't adventurous enough. But anybody who's in university administration will uh, appreciate that quote. Um, and as I do in the essay, I actually start with going back to 1939, which was um, the, the day of the World's Fair uh, organized in, in New York, actually in uh, Flushing Meadows, which was at that point a big garbage pile and uh, Robert Moses, you know, the great architect of uh, New York infrastructure had the idea to uh, organize this, uh, this World's Fair, which was uh, after the St. Louis one, the largest one ever organized, I think, in the, in the United States. And it was very interesting because it, it, it showcased many innovations. For instance, the first television was showed. There were 300 television sets at that time. And in fact, the first live broadcast was the opening speech of Franklin Roosevelt opening the World's Fair. Uh, there were also things like a beauty pageant of steam engines, which was more looking backwards. And my favorite, the first robot was actually shown. It was Electro. He could smoke and he had a little robot uh, dog to play with. Electro, come here. And here he comes, ladies and gentlemen, walking up to greet you under his own power. He could communicate playing gramophone records. So it was actually quite an interesting example. Uh, there was a second opening speech, which was given by Albert Einstein. And Einstein was the scientific advisor of the fair. And uh, his speech was about cosmic rays. So it was big news. There, there were 10 cosmic rays were captured in the Hayden Planetarium in Manhattan, then by telephone transferred to uh, the fairgrounds. And uh, after the 10th cosmic ray was uh, transported, a big switch was thrown. And then actually all the fuses blew. So I love this end of this article, the New York Times, that uh, you know the load was too much for the wiring system. And then the crowd dropped science in favor of a spectacle they could applaud, which I would say you know, is, uh, is our life. But I mentioned that speech because Einstein talked about cosmic rays, but he didn't talk about nuclear physics. And he didn't talk about computers. And both would, of course, very soon completely dominate life in the West. And of course, both of them were actually developed uh, in, in, in a significant way at IAS. 
So only a few months later, uh, Einstein would write the famous letter together with Leo Zillard. Uh, here you see a picture that's actually a reenactment of that act of the writing of the letter that they did this again for photo photographers in 1945. It started the, uh, the Manhattan Project. And during the war, actually John von Neumann and, and working on the work of Alan Turing was a graduate student in Princeton and Kurt Gödel, who of course was a faculty member uh, started thinking about computing machines. And uh, in 1949, uh, work started on the IES machine, which was the first modern architecture uh, computing machine. In fact, um, as was said, you know, there was nothing apart from books, brains, prestige, and high hopes that led to that development. The remarkable thing is the IES machine, the blueprint, was sent for free by von Neumann around the world. Alan Turing, working in the UK, they, uh, very, they patented the, 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 the design. And so the reason that you and I have uh, von Neumann architecture in my iPhone is uh, because this, uh, this, this information was widely shared. And I often like to point out that this, you know, within a few years, uh, these, all these developments from the peace movement led by Einstein to the work on the computer of Neumann and Oppenheimer, of course, they all three were here at IES. So this place that was created to uh, be as useless as possible uh, turned out to be have an extreme impact on the world. So what was the re remark of Flexner? So I often frame it in terms of uh, kind of a portfolio of ideas. And Flexner pointed out that uh, there are high risks, high reward events in the development of knowledge, which are curiosity driven transformative discoveries and ideas that are essentially driven by the innate curiosity of human beings, of researchers, uh, are of great intellectual depth, but have only a small probability of coming to fruition. And that these events, this long tail, has an extraordinary impact on the world. Now, there are a few remarks I want to make that are actually quite important, uh, because often people are mistaken here. The first is, this is a second order effect. That is to say, Flexner starts by saying that, uh, I'm just quoting here, a poem, a symphony, a painting, a mathematical truth, and scientific fact all bear in themselves all the justification that university colleges and institutes of research need or require. So he was not making the remark that uh, we should do, we should investigate knowledge because in the end it will turn out to be useful in an unexpected way. He basically turned things around. We should do it anyhow, but if we really look at the most useful impacts of knowledge, then they almost always started in kind of pure, um, the pure interest of scholars. A second point I want to make, I, I won't say much in this uh, talk about the role of humanities in the social sciences, uh, but I think also it would be terrific to have more examples of these indirect consequences of the humanities and social science. I'd like to point out that perhaps the biggest uh, impact of the humanities on say development of technology has been the revolution in the 15th and 16th and 17th century, the Renaissance, the appearance of the humanities uh, that essentially led to the modern scientific method. Uh, Galileo talked about the book of nature. And the idea was, of course, you should discuss and in interpret nature as much as you would interpret other books, the writings of the past, the Bible, etc. And the third point I want to make is actually a beautiful point made by Erwin Panofsky, the famous art historian that also came in the 1930s to the Institute, who wrote this kind of defense of, uh, in defense of the uh, ivory tower. Now, sometimes, you know, at IES is being described as the, uh, as the penthouse in the ivory tower. Uh, but uh, Panofsky has a, has a wonderful saying, saying that, you know, uh, isolated knowledge, he basically makes the point that a tower you know, has, there's something you can do if you're on the ground. And there are certain things you can do when you're in the, in the tower. In the tower, if you are in the tower, you see further. So you can see things from a long distance. And I said, you know, it comes with a responsibility, a social responsibility 
to act upon that knowledge, to warn society of these uh, further uh, views. Um, so that we should also keep in mind. Now, I would like to say, so let's start. So there is, you can ask, you know, what is technology? So these are some of my favorite definitions. One is technology is everything that was discovered after you were born. Uh, it's everything that doesn't work. Uh, but of course, it is something, it's you no know, more uh, seriously, it's a dominant force that shapes and changes both nature and culture. And it's already there in the minds and laboratories of scientists. So this is wonderful story. It's probably not true that the Ch British Chancellor of the Exchequer visited Michael Faraday in the 1830s in Britain to uh, see the wonderful experiments he was doing with electricity and magnets, you know, hair standing straight up, and asked, you know, what's good for? And that Faraday said to you, I have no idea, but one day you might tax it. Um, and we all pay taxes on our electricity bill. Uh, in fact, it took a long time for electricity to be valued. Uh, the first electric, electric light bulbs were uh, by Edison himself switched on in the editorial room of the New York Times in 1882. This did not appear on the front page. This was a small article on the miscellaneous news. Um, and I love the quote that it says, now these lights look very much like gas burning. Uh, no, they are more brilliant and steadier, and uh, they have no smell. So uh, it was not like the beginning of the electric age. It was just a small improvement on gas lamps. And even in 1900, you know, during the, the Universal Exposition in Paris, you know, electricity was presented as a very exotic thing. Another example, quantum mechanics. When quantum mechanics was born in 1900, Max Planck famously said that it was an act of desperation. He was willing to make any sacrifice to the principles of physics. So um, it was a really a desperate act. And now it's estimated that uh, with uh, you know, integrated circuits, lasers, sensors, that 30% of our economy is actually based on quantum mechanics. Here, I like to point out that 100% of reality is based on quantum mechanics. And this is rapidly increasing because you know, there are many quantum devices from a safe quantum internet to quantum computers and quantum materials that are being developed, will be implemented. So uh, this will have tremendous impact, but it's more than 100 years after that act of desperation. Now, I would say the most uh, shocking fact, of course, has been this incredible improvement in our health, you know, the doubling more than doubling of life expectancy in the last 150 years uh, at, at a rapid pace in the West, but actually in the global South, even faster, of course, making use of all these medical breakthroughs. So again, you, you know, it's a long term to see where we are now with medical technology. I love this little uh, notepad of Claude Shannon, who actually was also an IAS member who in 1949, for the first time, thinks about information and writes here the genetic constitution of man. He estimated that our genetic information would be 100,000 bits. Um, of course, it took a, a few more years in 1953 before DNA was discovered. Uh, indeed, it's incredibly dense information carrier. I like to point out that all the information on the internet can be put in one gram of DNA. So it's, it's very, very data intensive. And this story of reading the book of DNA has been going on for almost 70 years. Um, well, 60 years definitely to discover, decode, read, and understand it, and now rewrite it. Because we're able to, uh, using technology, to uh, rewrite DNA. And you know, we often say we live in a life in a time of huge data. The biomedical data is exploding. It roughly doubles every six months and probably even much more rapidly this, uh, this pandemic year. And so the life science have made tremendous progress. Now, we all are now benefiting, particularly in the US of these wonderful messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, this is a technology that could only have been developed if all that basic knowledge in, in life sciences was there. And you know, there was a wonderful story, perhaps you've seen it in the New York Times recently, 
about Dr. Kariko, a Hungarian uh, biochemist who for, for 35 years have been pushing this technology. And uh, you see also the two uh, founders of BioNTech, uh, which were responsible for uh, the Pfizer vaccine being honored here on the German publication Der Spiegel. So we all benefiting again of this incredible usefulness of these useless knowledge about you know, how is genetic information decoded. In fact, it's not just a linear story. One of my favorite examples is this is superconductivity was uh, discovered uh, in 1911 by a Dutch physicist in Leiden, Heike Kameling Onnes. It's the effect that if you cool certain materials to a low enough temperature, electric current will flow for free without any loss to resistance. And so in principle, a very, very strong magnetic field can be generated at very low cost. Now, he developed that by being able to push temperatures to lower and lower um, ranges. And you know, it's a wonderful story. When he became a professor in Leiden, he actually didn't start building his experiments. He didn't recruit PhD students. What he did, he started by uh, making a school for lab assistants, young men in this case, who could blow glass, work with copper and brass at much greater accuracy. So for the first 10, 20 years, very little happened because they all have to be trained. And it, I think it's a wonderful story that you, know, you have to start early. And I think these days, if a professor would start building a school, basically a dedicated high school for uh, lab assistants, I think that will not be possible. Now, of course, these uh, superconductivity is used in, in these, these trains. At uh, this point, I always uh, reminded of uh, New Jersey Transit, which doesn't look like this, uh, but you could have these uh, MacLev trains. Of course, fMRI scanners um, are working with these very, very strong magnets. In fact, you could argue all of neuroscience has been born out of that method. And so also all the cures for neurological diseases are heavily dependent on it. And for instance, these quantum computers, again, make use of these superconducting elements. In fact, the, the, the place in the world that you find the largest congregation of these very strong magnets is in CERN Geneva. In fact, it's in the what's called the Large Hadron Collider, this huge particle accelerator, 27 kilometers in circumference, that actually used that technology to bend particles with these very strong magnets, and so discover the Higgs particle. So uh, you see that fundamental science can lead to practical application as an fMRI scan, and actually then again be applied to find new uh, fundamental knowledge. Now, what's there out there to be discovered? And uh, you know, I uh, hardly dare to show this quote, but it's you know, this is famous saying by Donald Rumsfeld on the occasion of the invasion of Iraq, where he you know, introduced the known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And clearly, there were many of the last category, the latter category, uh, in, in, in his uh, policies. And uh, so we, we have to ask the question, you know, what do we know we don't know? And I often have this image of these old maps you know, where uh, cartographers would map out a part of the world. I think of that as the known signs. And then there was the part that was unknown that they should lay, leave blank. But of course, they didn't dare to leave it blank. So they painted all these kind of sea monsters there. And so you know, the question we ask, I think, you know, in, in fundamental basic science and knowledge, you know, what is there to be discovered? And what are the sea monsters that somehow are preventing us from uh, venturing into that great unknown? So how much do you know that you don't know? Now, I know that cosmologists feel that they're very lucky because they know exactly what they don't, don't know. Now, 95% of the energy content of the universe is missing. We call it dark matter, dark energy. But these are just sea monsters. Uh, we have no idea what exactly is. And I often ask this in other, in other disciplines. Recently, I asked an economist, you know, what's your dark matter? And he answered, inequality. We have no idea how it, how it happens. Uh, we have no idea how we can solve it. Uh, historians, of course, uh, deal with tremendous amount of information they don't know. 
I like the fact that of all the Greek epics uh, and plays, roughly, I think, 3% is, uh, of all the titles that we have, only 3% is actually uh, known to us in the, in the form of actual manuscripts. So there also we know exactly what we are missing. So we always have to keep that open mind. And I like this definition of Richard Feynman, the particle physicist, as science as the belief in the ignorance of experts. So part of it, of course, part of digging deep in knowledge is always keep an open mind and make sure that you're never absolutely 100% certain about uh, what you know. There, certainty only comes in certain degrees. And as you said, it's never, ever absolutely certain. A more succinct way to put this is by Francis uh, Crick of uh, DNA fame, who said, you know, theory that can account for all the facts is wrong because some of the facts are always wrong. Um, so, yeah, because there's always something that you know, doesn't fit well. And, you know, that's extremely exciting. Uh, perhaps you heard or read the last week, there was a, a fascinating discovery in particle physics. We don't know exactly what's going on, but it looks like that the model the world is not behaving according to our models. And so the theory might be wrong. And that's terrific. That's great news. Now, particularly exciting, I feel, is that often we think about fundamental knowledge. I mean, in my life, in, 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 in fundamental physics, in terms of the very large and very small. But I think it's exciting that we're also probing this very complicated middle part, a uh, part of reality which has great complexity. And I, I love to indicate this as following. I would say that you know we are moving in science from studying the building blocks to building things. And my favorite metaphor is that these, these two cars, one is made from metal, the other is made from Lego blocks. And you know, if you wait a few weeks, the first will not change, but the second will be turned into, say, an airplane. The thing, the thing is, once you have building blocks, you can start building. So this image of, uh, you know, certainly the natural sciences as exploring, you know, what we know we don't know, is a vast uh, underestimation of what is out there because we cannot only study what's out there, but we can study everything that we can make. Um, so, for instance, if you think about building blocks, we have the building blocks of life, genes and DNA. The number of organisms that have been built using natural evolution is a marginal fraction of all organisms that can possibly build out of these genetic codes. So the, the number of possible engineered life forms is vastly larger than the ones that have already appeared. In the same way in matter, we know that matter is made out of particles and atoms and molecules. The number of materials that occur naturally is a small fraction of all possible materials. And the same way with the information. Now, the possible number of computer programs is vastly larger than everything that we have been thinking up to now. An exciting thing is that in all three domains, we are just on the threshold of getting these you know, constructive methods. Like in genetics, we are in the age of CRISPR-Cas, editing of DNA, in quantum technology, we design, see designer materials. And I will say in a moment something about this. We're also living in a life of artificial intelligence. And these are great opportunities, potential applications in genetic engineering with personalized medicine, medicine, you know, completely artificial life in the nano and quantum world where somehow the world of life and technology are, uh, are colliding. And I would say in the information where we have this collision of computing and big data, that leads to you know, very exciting developments. Uh, as you know, artificial intelligence is, is here to stay. It, it somehow bridged this huge gap there is between how computers work and how human beings work. Some of you might have not, not heard about Moravec's paradox that basically says that uh, things that are easy for computers, like multiplying large numbers, are very difficult for human beings. And things that are easy for human beings, like running around and playing soccer, are very difficult for computers because they are so different. Computers, you know, have, they, they work in terms of fixed algorithms, while human beings are self-learning, are shaped by evolution. 
and artificial intelligence actually taking, in some sense, moving computers from the artificial domain and you know, considering them very much like human beings. And this uh, is, is extremely exciting development that you know, is not only shaping our lives uh, for good or for worse, uh, we, we can debate that, but also shaping science. Now, for, for example, every year there is a competition where chemists are given the chemical formulas for a number of proteins, and they are asked to predict the shape of the protein. And the shape of the protein, to a large extent, determines its role, its mechanisms. And um, this, uh, this competition was won by a artificial intelligence machine, by DeepMind's program, um, that actually was able to uh, really, in a, in a very, very significant way, beat the competition. So we are moving in a, in a, in a, in a world where you know, there is this, we are able to probe these great uh, structures of co great complexity. And we are trying to find new insights, new concepts, new ideas, new theories. Of course, there are many questions about that. You know, we have no idea which class of problems can be addressed. We have no idea how robust these results are, or that they generalize, or even if we can ever understand these structures. Now, there's a great series in the Wall Street Journal that's about uh, careers of the future. And they had this wonderful uh, episode about the robot psychologist. And this was not about a robot you know, interrogating human beings as a psychologist, but this human being putting the robot on the sofa and trying essentially using cognitive psychology to figure out whether the machines are, are feeling well, whether we're stable and where they are working. Now, this is all extremely interesting because this doesn't look like modern science. It looks like very messy. It looks uh, very unpredictable. Um, it, it looks a little bit like ordinary life. And so in fact, there has been a very intense debate among AI um, researchers whether this is, uh, should be seen as true science. In fact, you know, we had, an, uh, we had a beautiful uh, seminar on this uh, two years ago under the title Alchemy or Science. You know, is AI the new alchemy? And there, are so, there were some very prominent researchers who uh, called the entire field alchemy, basically saying, you know, we have no idea what we're doing. Uh, we're just kind of uh, messing around. Now, I think this is a very interesting point because this goes entirely, I would say, against the spirit of Flexner. So Flexner had a very linear model. And I must say, I'm often guilty of believing in this linear model. So the idea is take Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, a brilliant idea, thinking deeply about space and time, then leading to very precise measurements. And now this took almost 100 years till we are now in a position to measure all the intricacies of his theory. And then finally, applying these insights. For instance, our modern GPS system could only work using relativity theory. In fact, you know, it would be off by, I think, like seven miles a day if you, if you would, would not know both the special and the general theory of relativity. And so when we celebrated 100 years of relativity, I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal. And the title was, without Albert Einstein, we'd all be lost. So it's a good example of an application. But actually, you can run that argument exactly the wrong, the opposite way. So I could easily have written, of uh, Flexner could have written a book under the title, The Uselessness of Useful Knowledge. In fact, there is a great tradition of messing around and finally arriving at deep insights. So a good example is steam engines that were developed in the late 18th century, early 19th century. People tried a lot to improve them. There was a lot of tinkering of piecemeal engineering. In the end, scientists start to do much more controlled experiments, and they were discovering certain laws, which are now known as the law of thermodynamics. These laws you could have thought of by just sitting behind your desk and thinking deeply. Um, they do need the concept of molecules and atoms. But uh, the history of this idea is exactly the opposite way. And in fact, those who are saying that, uh, you know, uh, or who are countering the argument 
that you know well, AI or other fields, modern fields in science are like alchemy, say, well, wait a moment, there's a long tradition of tinkering and then finally discovering deep truth, like optics. You know, uh, I think the first uh, telescopes were probably developed by uh, glass makers who uh, had the clever idea to take two glasses, two lenses and glasses and putting them uh, behind each other. Uh, think about aerodynamics. You know, the, the are, are now we have deep insights in the flow of air, uh, but of course that's not how planes were developed. People were just trying out various different kind of designs. In fact, I'm not a historian of science and historians of science can tell you much more, but there's something of a reconsideration of alchemy these days by saying it was not completely crackpot. Uh, you know, you can think of it as a kind of proto chemistry. Uh, you know, people had careful procedures. Um, they they tried a lot of different things. Uh, it's hard to think of the birth of modern chemistry without that fuzzy beginning of tinkering in a very unstructured way. In fact, you know, it's not unrealistic to make uh, gold out of lead. Uh, you know, the first uh, gold was made in the 1940s. It was actually radioactive gold. And then in 1981, the famous uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist Glenn Seaborg actually made gold atoms out of bismuth, which is a very close partner of, um, of, of lead. And I think the cost was something like, I think it was like $80,000 per gold atom. So it was not a very efficient way to make gold, but you can make gold out of lead. It's called nuclear physics. And, um, so perhaps uh, we should be open-minded if we think about, uh, if we claim that you know, fundamental knowledge is the, is the way to get you know, societal innovations. It might be the other way around too. Innovations might trigger very deep thought. Now, it is good to think about exactly what that usefulness of basic research is. And I think there are several components to distinguish, as I said, the first and foremost is knowledge in and of itself. Uh, just the great pleasure of understanding the world. Then secondly, there are these kind of transformative ideas and technologies that come out of it. Um, and uh, I gave you many examples. Think of modern medicine. Then, you know, basic research asks for the development of new tools and techniques. I always like to point out that the World Wide Web was developed at CERN, at the particle accelerator, because there were 10,000 people all over the world that had to collaborate to build an instrument. It's not a coincidence that these days we are connecting with each other right now through these same tools. These tools were developed. The internet was developed to collaborate. Uh, and it was a great surprise, by the way, for the computer scientists that when they first start to connect computers to each other, that actually that connection, because you might wonder, why do you want to connect to computers? The surprising usefulness of that idea was that it would actually connect the two people who were working with the two computers. And the fact that you sent an email to somebody else, the two the co computers and their connection are just intermediates. Clearly it's attracting you now the best minds and that's certainly the role model um, that we have in mind for the Institute who kind of sharpened their intelligence on, on working on the most difficult problems. And of course, it drives innovation and startups and, and economic growth. And I must also say, it's truly an international public good. I have this river delta image on the background because once knowledge uh, streams downstream to applications, it's spread very broadly and it's very difficult for an individual or a university or a country, I would say, to fully capture a brilliant idea. Now, this economic impact is difficult to assess. There is a lot of um, papers from economists, they, they, it's hard for them to agree, but the European Commission estimate that a 10% growth in R&D activities will lead to a 1.1 to 1.4% increase in GDP. And with the current expenditures, that means a multiplication, a multiplier of five to seven. Um, this is what MIT says. MIT, MIT some time ago claimed that they generated 30,000 companies 
with almost 5 million employees with any revenues of uh, 2 trillion, which would be the 10th largest economy in the world. Uh, it's actually twice the, uh, the economy of the Netherlands, to, uh, just to indicate, by, M by MIT graduates. Uh, another uh, favorite is this one. It's a $4 million grant that the National Science Foundation gave to uh, the Digital Libraries Initiative in Stanford, where um, the founders of Google, now Alphabet, were graduate students. Of course, they, they uh, jumped out uh, the university and started Google. And current market cap is uh, more than a, a trillion. So that one grant has a multiplication, a multiplier of 300,000. Some people point out the NSF could have sent uh, checks for 299,999 uh, grant applications and never see anything in return and still come out uh, with a plus. Now, if you look at R&D's expenditure in terms of the federal budget, uh, as a percentage, just it's just a percentage of our budget, which of course is closely linked to uh, the economy, you see that it uh, really peaked at a quite a high level, um, you know, including uh, non-defense and defense. It was almost 12% of the total federal budget uh, at the height of the Cold War and the space race, just to indicate the Apollo program uh, would cost in current uh, dollars roughly 300 billion. Um, I remind you, we just uh, had a stimulus uh, program of 1.1900 billion. Uh, at that time, 0.4% of the GDP. And the Manhattan Project that I talked earlier about would be in current dollars roughly 25 billion, so not very expensive. But at that time, the economy, of course, was much smaller. And it was also roughly at a half a percent of GDP. Now, after World War II, there was this very influential report, Science, the Endless Frontier. And uh, by the way, it's a wonderful uh, new edition with uh, 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 pr uh, an introductory essay by Rush Holt that was just published by Prince University Press. The famous uh, Vannevar Vannevar Bush report uh, that set essentially the course of government involvement at a very high level in science and research. And of course, that led to the development of science funders all over the world. And it's very interesting that uh, the current administration uh, sent uh, the President uh, Biden, then President-elect Biden, sent a very similar letter to the letter that President Roosevelt sent in 1944 to his science advisor, Eric Lander. And you know, his deputy, of course, is our Alondra Nelson who's a deputy director for science and society, essentially asking him the same questions that uh, Roosevelt asked, uh, because he asked, you know, how can science and technology be benefit the nation's health and economic and prosperity after the war? Now, but many things are different now. You know, if you go to 1950s, 60s, you will have, for instance, you know, industrial laboratories like the famous Bell Laboratories that were here in New Jersey that were altogether nine Nobel Prizes, uh, among others for the discovery of the Big Bang, the cosmic microwave background radiation in 1963 by Ben Sides and Wilson. Um, now, I think it's very, we, we haven't seen that many Nobel Prizes coming out of industrial laboratories. And so the, 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 the burden of fundamental research or basic research as it's qualified in, in, in the United States, and the United States is, by the way, one of the few countries that's keeping these statistics, has been got more and more on the shoulders of federal money. I would say also universities and colleges are, are, are carrying a lot of it through their endowments. And you see the contributions of industry in basic research is, uh, is very little. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's little more than, than 5%. Now, finally, I want to say something about what drives this um, useless knowledge that turns out to be so useful. And Flexner writes about this. He writes very nicely that it's curiosity um, that is a characteristic of modern thinking, but it's not new. It goes back to all the great heroes of science, of the, sci the first scientific revolution, Galileo, Bacon, of course, and Newton. And I love the, this uh, wonderful metaphor that actually I, I, I was told by, by the famous Princeton physicist John Wheeler, 
that you know uh, the Iron Duke of Wellington has this famous quote that in all the business of war, and indeed all the business of life, is to endeavor to find out what you don't know by what I called guessing what's on the other side of the hill. And in fact, he actually took this literally. When he finally retired as prime minister of Britain, he would take his guests on a stagecoach around some part of England that were new to all of them. And they would look at the hill and they would estimate what's behind the hill. Is it the forest? Is it the lake? Is it the town? The meadows? And uh, apparently, uh, Wellington was extremely good in playing that game. So I like to use that as, a, as an image. I would say we have, there are two ways in which we can look at the other side of the hill. We have our imagination. That's our tunnel vision. That's the way to look through barriers and imagine something that isn't there yet. And then there is curiosity, which is the drive to climb the hill and actually have a look. And of course, both of them are uh, amply uh, present in children uh, who, uh, you know, whenever they see a hill or something, they have to climb it. And I want to end by this uh, very favorite uh, anecdote for me. It's again about a Dutch scientist. It's Jacobus Henricus van het Hof, uh, who was a chemistry professor in Amsterdam and then later in Berlin. He actually won the first Nobel Prize in chemistry because he invented a century field called stereochemistry. Uh, he was basically the first to realize that molecules are three-dimensional. And I love this little image that you see here of the paper models of uh, molecular models that he used. And you know, if you take one of these and you hold them in front of a mirror, you will see that the molecule is different. And in fact, almost all the molecules in our body, from DNA to proteins, are chiral. That is to say, they come in with one-handedness. They, they, they rotate in one way. For instance, a DNA is a, is a, is a right-moving spiral. If you would make a left-moving version of it, it would be totally ineffective. So our body is a little bit like the screws and nuts that you use to build a, a something. Now I'm telling this story because Van der Hof was a childhood hero of me. Every time I would walk to my uh, high school, I would see this uh, great statue. He was actually a teacher in the high school in an early stage, and um, and you know he uh, wrote his inaugural thesis uh, when he was a professor, made professor in Amsterdam, with the title of the thesis was The Power of Imagination in Science. And the reason he wrote this, because as a young man, he was criticized. He was actually criticized by Kolbe, which was the main German chemist at that time. And he was the German text. Um, who He wrote about Van der Hof, who at that point was working in the veterinary school as a very young chemist. And he writes here in the English translation, that von der Hof has no liking for exact chemical investigation. He is considered more comfortable to mount Pegasus, the flying horse, apparently borrowed from the veterinary school, a little uh, dick at his uh, humble uh, uh, statue, and to proclaim how atoms appear to him arranged in space uh, without. Uh, so basically, he, he was being accused of being too imaginative. And von der Hof was really very upset about it. So his, his oration, his inaugural lecture was all about defending the power of imagination. Now, one thing is very interesting. I actually looked up the quote. And at some point, Kolbe says, you know, if Germany isn't able to uh, recruit uh, people like von der Hof, we will lose the competition. He essentially is quite, uh, he actually praises his imagination. but. Apparently, von der Hof was so upset he didn't read the next paragraphs. But what did he do in his inaugural thesis? Well, he made a list. He made a list of the 200 most famous scientists around in that year, in uh, 1875. And he puts them in three different categories. The first is the one of scientists without imagination. So no known interest in literature, in music, in the arts. Then there's the one with interest in the arts, who read poetry, who collect paintings, who go to musical performances. And then finally, he has a, a list with what he calls 
people with a um, sick sickness of the mind, they have too much imagination. So they believe in alchemy, they do crazy stuff. They uh, and that list is actually pretty pretty amazing list because it you know it has Leibniz and Newton and Ampere and I would say uh, all the great names of history of science are uh, end up in the third bucket, the ones with uh, too much imagination. So I think that's kind of a wonderful lesson. Uh, that's a lesson that uh, clearly um, Flexner was, uh, was indicating and that uh, I think we can learn from that, that you know, we need uh, imagination and curiosity. Um, it's a wonderful gift that people have this, uh, Einstein famously said, you know, that imagination is more important than knowledge because imagination also describes everything that we do not yet know. And uh, they, that, that fostering that curiosity and imagination has been a terrific, uh, a terrific success. So I'm end ending with uh, my favorite uh, postcard, which actually is right, right around he here me. Uh, it's something I got uh, from a few years ago. So I don't know, uh, I like to say that I don't know uh, where postcards go that are written to the uh, Santa Claus or North Pole, because I have no idea where these, these cards go. But if people write, if children write to Albert Einstein, they come to the Institute for Advanced Study and they particularly come to my desk. So a few years ago, I got this wonderful uh, postcard by a, a very young child who writes to Albert Einstein, I hope you will never stop being curious. And um, I think uh, that's perhaps the most important message of, uh, of this lecture. So please, you know, take that to heart. And um, let me finish the lecture. And thank you for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I had a good glass of Prosecco with it. Thank you very much. I think we have a few more uh, minutes, if you want, for, I would say, you know, a discussion. Because this is a, this is a topic that nobody can uh, can argue that they're not an expert in. Um, it's about uh, very general properties. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, I talked about many, many, many items. Um, so I'm sure there are remarks, insights, um, examples, things that you want to add. So either raise your hand, raise your voice, do it. Uh, art yes, I see the first one. Ashutosh. <laughs> Hello, Robert. Uh, Hello. So, uh, thank you uh, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I actually recently read the book, uh, Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Wonderful book. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, like you talk about curiosity, imagination. Yes, and I also wonder about the same. What is, uh, what is your idea or vision around uh, including the field of philosophy at the Institute? Well, I think, you know, th that's a very good question. You know, th there's a, actually, there's a, there was a wonderful piece in the New York Review at some years ago by Freeman Dyson about uh, the role of philosophy and history, actually, uh, in particular in the sciences. And he made the point that, you know, that's uh, is, is, is truly important element, I think, in the way we think about knowledge and knowledge production. So something that also has happened, I think, over the last decades is that we have been thinking a little bit more in specialization. I know I think our whole world has been become more specialized. Um, we are less open, perhaps, to uh, borrow from other fields. And I personally feel this actually, uh, you know, particularly I think in, in, in physics, and there's the famous, uh, you know, so-called shut up and, and calculate school in quantum mechanics. So we don't care about philosophical issues, don't care about historical issues. Well, even in the very narrow confines of quantum theory, it's wonderful to see that the whole philosophy of science has been come back because now these deep problems in quantum physics are important when you develop quantum devices like quantum computers. But I would say that if we, if we have a serious discussion about imagination and curiosity, we should also should think about how we organize the academic world itself. And um, 
No, uh, I'm very optimistic about how knowledge is developing. I'm less optimistic about the architecture of knowledge. And you could argue that you know we, we create a lot of artificial walls within the academy that uh, might uh, you know might at some point hinder and obstruct um, progress. Uh, certainly something that we try to uh, amend in certain ways at IES, but it's something that I think is is a very interesting discussion about you know how do we as individuals and also how do we as a society want to structure our knowledge and what is the role of um, I should be have being a little bit more like a generalist than than a specialist. Thank you so much. This was less of an issue, I would say, in flexionist time. <laughs> yes. Charles, uh, uh, Charles Thompson, you have a question. Will you want to ask it uh, live? <laughs> Sure, I was just to thank you for this lovely talk, Robert. I was just asking if, in your opinion, there are any no-go areas, things where you think, or whoever should decide, thinks we just shouldn't go, things with dual use that could be weaponized in the hands of the wrong people, things that cannot help but be used with our, our current level of evilness in discriminatory ways that make some people premature, you know, susceptible to premature death for example, um, or environmental destruction? Thank you. Well, that's, that's an absolutely terrific question. And that was an aspect that was like totally missing because you know, in some sense, the uh, probably you know, just but my, the glass half full attitude of my, my personality that we were really <laughs> thinking in terms of knowledge and technology as progressing. And of course it's neutral, it's, you know, and the example of nuclear physics is a, is, is, is a great example to show know that there is dual use in anything mm -hmm. and um and so um i would say well uh, there, there's there, there's a lot to be said here right so so uh, one thing i think one thing that's very important to know of course is to certainly map out what's out there right because it's very difficult to say you shouldn't go in a certain direction basically you can only say you shouldn't go in a certain direction if you already know that there's actually something dangerous there and it could be potentially be developed. Um, I think we need these discussions. Uh, now one thing um, that um, actually in my little preface to the Flexner, I said, yeah, I agree with Flexner or everything. I do not agree. He had a very elitist view of science and knowledge. And I would say even um, Veneva Bush had a very elitist view. And I think most of us agree that, you know, in the present, if you want to think about the development of science and knowledge, scholarship, you know, this should be done, you know, in consultation with engagement of society and not so much to explain what's going on, but also to give people a voice in, you know, do you want to go in a certain direction? Um, of course, what we have learned in the past with all, I would say the negative developments of science and technology that often the solution was again technology, right? So say that the, the, the best way to safeguard against some nuclear disaster is using the same technology for very, very sensitive measurement instruments uh, in which we can track exactly how materials are carried around the world. If you are worried about biotech uh, weapons or something, then you hope that in some sense our uh, regular biotechnology is able to uh, to be one step ahead. So in some sense, well, often we you get in an arms race kind of uh, kind of situation. But there are profound discussions these days, indeed, about AI. People warn about you know general artificial intelligence and all the frightening prospects. So I think this is an incredibly important element. And I would say there's something else which I worry about which I haven't talked, but that's the fact that um, science and technology are incredibly successful. They're so successful that they are almost hidden. You know, that, that is to say, uh, I don't know exactly what's happening in here. I don't know exactly what I get if I take my vaccine shot. Um, so we are literally, you know, we, many of us now have a product of biotechnology in us. And uh, we, but do we fully understand what's going on? So there is there is another risk, which is that you know technology and science is totally pervasive. 
it controls all of it, but we're completely ignorant of it and we have no idea what's, what's happening. And I think this is again, something that we have to think through. And, and of course here, we definitely need uh, all the sciences, particularly also, I think the humanities and the social sciences and legal, et cetera, to, to think about it. So, but uh, no, it's, uh, well, I'm, I'm very happy you have a whole year uh, devoted on this <laughs> in the School of Social Science. Thank you. Jacob. Thank you so much for a really beautiful and inspiring talk, Robert. Um, I also am a fan of the uh, epistemological contributions of Donald Rumsfeld. And uh, one of the things I, th I think that one notices is that Rumsfeld left out the category of unknown knowns. In other words, taken for granted ideas or biases or assumptions that we know and that shape our thinking, but that we may not be consciously aware of. And that strikes me as something that's very much in tension with the imagination. And so I wonder if you have some thoughts about how we can identify those kinds of unknown knowns, bring them to the surface and figure out how they can sort of be disrupted where necessary and otherwise unshackle our imaginative capacity. Well, that's that's a terrific question. I guess you know I'm immediately thinking in, in terms of the old maps. That would be you know the thing that would be mapped out would be mapped out wrong, right? That's uh, or something would be would be uh, um, on purposely left out, uh, some secret place or something. Yes. Well, you know, it, 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 I don't think I have a simple simple answer to this, but you know, I think there is. Um, I think the first thing is, of course, that like in the way we educate, honestly, it's almost only about the known knowns, right? Uh, the other three categories are hardly mentioned. And I, I've seen with my own students that often, you know, that comes as a great surprise that what they thought was a perfectly mapped out world certainly had all these kind of empty spots and that even the things that, um, so, you know, a good example again is this, um, you know, uh, going back to cosmology, you know, the fact that, you know, now we have dark energy, dark matter, but uh, 20 years ago, uh, that percentage of dark knowledge was zero, right? So, uh, and we had a completely misunderstanding about uh, our, what the universe was composed of. So I think actually, you know, part of this is, I think also how we communicate about what science and technology and knowledge is. I think, um, you know, certainly I think the working scholar is much more focused on these issues. Um, in, in some sense, now what already has been understood is completely uninteresting to us because we want to add something. That's often also why we are so bad in presenting knowledge because we immediately focus on the things that are unknown instead of just presenting people with a, a solid basis. But I think, you know, it's, it's, it, we could do much more of this in our education. Um, and one of my biggest delight is that these kind of discussions are only truly interesting if you have them between different fields because you know the the wonderful way is that you're somehow within your ignorance you can in a nice way connect to other fields like this is what i don't understand it's so i find it fascinating that the economist without a blink immediately said inequality when i said to you what's your dark matter right so that that's that's these are interesting conversations and they might be confusing for uh, first year students, uh, but I think we should among scholars among ourselves and me and also I think in the public in general, it's good to have these discussions and 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 clearly you know Rumsfeld is a perfect case to show what goes wrong if you if you don't have these discussions. Uh, a question Jeffrey. We want to ask the question live? Okay, uh, sure. I mean, yes. as you know, and this was a fabulous lecture, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, but as you know, in the US at least, there has been rising a kind of politicization of views on the utility of science of knowledge, <laughs> scientific method even. How widely among developed countries has this kind of skepticism toward science that we've seen rising in the American political debate especially the disdain for basic science and reduction in funding for it, been spreading. And conversely, what payoff do the 
kind of poorest of developing countries get for putting whatever pennies they can from their budgets into basic science? Is there a societal benefit that they can get uh, given that all of the advances in the, the top 10% of, of the world's uh, most developed countries are going to far outpace them anyway? Does yeah. it benefit them? Well, these are both very good questions. So uh, again, uh, there is a lot of work about this like trust in science uh, <coughs> across the globe. And it's quite fascinating because there's, there's a lot of diversity I noticed. So I think, you know, it, it, in first approximation, this virus of skepticism is spreading. So you see, because the same social media are, are extremely effective in, so, I must say, you know, I was really surprised when somehow I saw like people in the Netherlands, you know, quoting American websites and, you know, and, and so this, this is everywhere, but there are still remarkable changes in uh, public trust uh, in different societies, also trust in science and trust in science policy. So social scientists, I think, are studying this and it, it, it's very interesting. One thing I find very uh, hopeful at some point, this was, I think, in the context of climate change, that um, there are certain parts in the world, particularly the global south, where um, there is not that much knowledge or uh, let's say knowledge is rapidly increasing in terms of climate change. But it often comes immediately with a great um, Kind of dedication to to act, etc. So it's it there there. You now you, you have countries like the U.S. that's very well informed and still very confused. There are countries that are not well informed but they're not confused, and then there are countries that are well informed and also not in confused. Like Japan, I think is you know is is doing very well. So it's interesting that all four uh, appear and um, and certainly I'm. I feel, you know, we need a lot of more research to understand this because it's absolutely crucial. Uh, in terms of the payoff of developing countries, no, uh, the good thing, of course, is that we're starting to have a global uh, science system. And you no, know, it's absolutely amazing how many parts of the world are now like online and people, young people are turning into this. So there's, I, I think, you know, there, the, the great thing, the great model, I think, you know, for particularly for basic science, particularly the expensive kind of basic science, is to do it in a collaborative way. And um, I'm, I'm a great fan of some of the collaborative projects that Europe has been doing. Uh, you know, the, Europe is leading in this moment in particle physics, partly leading in astronomy, because it is kind of growth model where, you know, countries can participate and they participate at a fixed rate of their GDP, so um, which you know seems fair. So I think they can. Um, you know, there are wonderful examples of uh, great, great science. So I think the one thing that we should all realize is that talent in science, in, in scholarship, is uniformly distributed around the world. Uh, and it, so if you start to think about it, and then think about how small percentage of the world actually has been mined, so to say, in the past centuries for talent. How many kind of Einsteins, Curies, Mozarts have disappeared, you know, because simply there was no opportunity. So I think, you know, we, it's very deserving to, uh, for the whole world to get these talents out. So I would say that, you know, in some sense, basic science is pretty cheap. It's something that you motivates people. Um, it's you can easily participate if you are connecting to large collaborations. Uh, on the other hand, I do feel if we are going to build the next particle uh, accelerator or the ne the next huge uh, you know, fusion uh, experiment, then you know countries should should participate in terms of their economic. Um, capabilities. I did. I see another question. Otherwise, we are. Yeah, this is Bruce Bowman. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, um, uh, I acknowledge you for a beautiful talk. Um, I, I think a lot about innovation and curiosity and imagination. 
And there's another variable in the equation. Uh, and Van Hoff spoke about it a lot, and that's energy. I mean, there are people who are, are highly curious, but to pursue that curiosity and make discoveries uh, requires a great deal of energy. I mean, uh, you really have to have a lot of conviction and uh, perseverance and to, to move forward with, with your, your curiosity. And I was wondering if you think about, about people, individuals who are highly curious, whether they have the, the energy to get over that hill to, um, to make the discoveries. That's a good point. Uh, no, so one of the great delights, I think, you know, being a, being a scientist is to uh, get to know people who have to be certainly seem to have unlimited energy and you are cranking out paper after paper after paper and are in these flows. So the, it's, I don't think it's just energy, but you know, there's something about research that certain people at the right moment, everything clicks and, you know, they, they, ha they have a head start and you, you know, it's, it, it's just tremendous. And, and, and the, I think, you know, certainly, and I think in research, there is a enormous difference between, I would say the number one and the number two sometimes. So, so the, and it has, certainly this energy is an, is an element to it. Um, you know, I love this idea that you, you need the energy, but young children have to climb the hill. But you know, you, you can also be pushed up the hill. So the, one of the great thing is that you know you can work in collaborations, and um, and I would say uh, one of the great advantages that we have seen over the say the last century is that you know research has been become much more collaborative. We can help each other. People with excess energy uh, can can help others, and you know the other people have excess imagination or <laughs> excess curiosity. Um, uh, it's, you know, I'm not quite sure what the right metaphor is. You know, I, I, I at some point we had a discussion about, you know, the, in the individualistic versus the, the collective, uh, way in which, uh, uh and, and somebody said, well, you know, it's the psychology of scientists that want to, um, somehow make it an individual thing, but in practice, it's much more collective. And then somebody said, well, the, the right metaphor is modern jazz. Uh, and then somebody else says, well, but nobody listens to modern jazz. <laughs> the right point. But uh, there is something, there's something terrific, I think, in terms of the diversity, not just of knowledge, but in personalities, in motivation, in where people come from, what they want to achieve, whether they're collaborative or not. And you know, one thing I think we have learned that you know, enhancing that diversity. Uh, in the scholarly community, actually, uh, is, 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 I think, a great factor in success. So, as I said, you know, this is something, coming back to Freeman Dyson, who made that point again and again and again, he wanted both intellectual diversity, but I think there's also diversity in kind of the personalities. And I would say we need all of them. Uh, but uh, I would say sometimes the field is extremely lucky to have such a high energy person. And that makes all the difference. That that truly makes all the difference. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I think Robert. Sorry. Yes. Judy Shani. Hey, Judy. Good to see you. Hey, hey, I want to tell you a little bit about an experience I had when my first husband was a scientist from Britain, studied with George Porter, and okay. and um, he worked for Dupont, and he told me that they were having a great deal of trouble with. Uh, young men or women <clears throat> who were applying for jobs because they had no tolerance for ambiguity. They had to know how things were going to turn out. And so I was teaching Montessori at the time. And so he helped me set up 40 little experiments for children where <clears throat> they could, I would do, show them how to do it. They could do the experiments but I would never tell them how it was going to turn out. I wanted them to keep trying. And I said, just make guess, guesses. Now, later I was teaching in a public school and the principal came into my room and said, we're having trouble here. Some of your children are looking out the windows. And I said, well, <laughs> yes, they're thinking. 
And he said, I don't want you to do any more of your discovery science with them. And I said, why is that? And he said, because I don't know how to grade discovery. Mm. And I, I just resigned. I thought, I can't teach here. But <clears throat> that's, that was the problem. Everybody wanted to tell the children how it would turn out. And that would just kill them. Well, that's a wonderful story, Judy. And I think you know, often uh, I, I, I make a similar point because you know, if you ask me, you know, how can we uh, prepare children for a future where a lot of things have to be reinvented or invented, but also you know, how do we in the end understand knowledge? And I think we need to understand more about how knowledge is being produced, not just the facts, but the method by which it is being produced. And that method, the scientific method or whatever you call it, is something that, you, of course, you can demonstrate and uh, experience by doing experiments themselves. And so I think you know, there's, there, there is, a, there is a certainly a current in education that is trying to promote this. It's difficult, I know. And my experience is very much that you, know, you need that. Um, it's not. You know, I think you, it, it's just one other way to approach the world. Uh, you know, being some, you know, it's wonderful to hear about abstract concepts. It's great to hear about the history. It's great to some children are really resonating if they see a concrete application, uh, and others if they can do it themselves. And what I, uh, you must have the same experience. If you pick another method of teaching, I always say you tilt. The classroom because those who were very good in one way of approaching the problem might not sometimes work very badly if you do something in a collective way let's see how can they work in teams you get yet another dynamic so i think it's extremely important that we teach this and i would say that you know certainly with you know machines being become more and more dominant you can really wonder you know what is our contribution as human beings to all of it and I would say that was in the end of my lecture. It's you know it's the it's our imagination, it's our curiosity, it's our 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 natural innate wish to experiment because every child ch child is experimenting. You know if they get building blocks, they will build something out of, and they build something else. And so I think that's something that we should stimulate. Question is, do our educational systems allow for that? Um, I, I think you know there's a general trend. <laughs> that we are becoming more and more, uh, I would say, risk adverse. Um, now for certain elements in life, that's good. Uh, for others, it's not. So uh, I, I started that, you know, I think knowledge is a kind of almost an investment portfolio. You have certain high risk, high reward, and something more cautious approaches. And I think that should be a general way in which we approach life and also education. But, you know, I'm totally with you. This is something that, uh, I would say that the, the, the mechanism, the system as we have right now is probably more effective in uh, diminishing the creativity imagination than actually enhancing it. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you uh, for attending the lecture. Uh, it's great to see you here. Uh, it's not really, uh, it was wonderful. See you soon at another uh, public lecture, or I hope in person soon. <laughs>